This lesion was incidentally discovered in this patient. To understand where the abnormality is, this is the nasal cavity, and this area here is the nasopharynx. So this is a well-defined and rounded hypodense lesion in the midline of the nasopharynx. Here's a sagittal image to show the same abnormality showing the nose and the nasal cavity, and this posteriorly is the nasopharynx. As I scroll to the midline, you're going to see the same abnormality showing a well-defined appearance and central low density. This is called a torn walled cyst. This is basically a congenital cyst that has no clinical significance unless it gets infected. If you look at your CT or MRI scans of the head and neck, this would be seen in about 5% of cases, so it's relatively common. Especially when this abnormality has a larger size, such as what we see in this case, it might be confusing. However, the well definition, the low density consistent with fluid, and the classic midline location would make this a clear diagnosis. The way this lesion is classically described is that it lives between these two prevertebral muscles, namely, these are the longest collie muscles. Please note that the composition of this lesion may be of simple fluid or proteinaceous components, which might change the appearance on MR. Also remember that the proteinaceous composition may give you a higher density than this on CT scan. This is not an enlarged adenoid, since it does not have soft tissue density. It is not a nasopharyngeal carcinoma, since it is well defined and does not have invasive features. The only differential diagnosis that might have a similar appearance but would be to the side of the midline, a paramidline lesion, is called a mucosal retention cyst. Mucosal retention cysts classically occupy this lateral pharyngeal recess and that's why they have this elongated or pear-shaped appearance. Mucosal retention cysts are related to inflammation and are not congenital as compared to this lesion here, the torn wall cyst. So remember, a torn wall cyst is well-defined of fluid density in the midline between the longus coli muscle without invasive features or soft tissue components. Remember that it is a commonly seen lesion and that it might have various densities depending on the fluid composition. Do not confuse this appearance for a retention mucosal cyst that is classically seen laterally instead of the midline. Thanks for watching. More cases later this week. You probably have noticed this nodular-like abnormality on the left side. From a first glance, you might think that this is a true lung nodule. However, looking carefully, you'll discover that this is not the case. Remember that things could project over the lung from outside. So whenever you see a lung nodule, make sure that it's really within the lung. The sign that I want to show you today here is this. If you look carefully at the nodule, you'll see that it's really well defined on this side, while you lose the nodular border on the medial side. This is called the incomplete border sign, and it's a sign of an extrinsic nodule. This is the nodule that we're describing, and if you look on the other side, you're going to see a similar nodule with a similar incomplete border sign, and these are representing nipple shadows. Again, on the right side, you see a very well-defined border laterally and an ill-defined border medially, an incomplete border sign. To explain the sign, anything that is of soft tissue density and that has contact with air would be well-defined. Part of the finding that is not in contact with air, such as the base of the nipple that is in contact with the chest wall, will be ill-defined. This is not only true for nipple shadows, but it's also true for anything from outside, such as a skin tag or even a pleural plaque. Despite all of that, sometimes you see what looks like a nodule, or you're not 100% sure that this represents a nipple shadow, especially if it's only obvious on one side. In such cases, you could repeat the examination after putting a metallic marker on the nipple, so that would highlight the location of the nipple on the follow-up chest X-ray. Another simple trick is to look at the lateral chest radiograph, if available, and see if you could see the nipple on the outside of the chest. And here's the lateral chest radiograph on the same patient, where you at least see this 
soft tissue shadow, which represents one of the nipples. This is the subcutaneous tissue on a magnified view, and this oval soft tissue density that's wider than the rest of the tissue is the nipple shadow. So remember, opacities from outside may mimic true lung nodules. Nipple shadows are common, and you could know that by an incomplete border sign. If you're not sure, try to repeat with a nipple marker or look at the lateral chest radiograph. Thanks for watching. Today's short clip is a kind of a show and tell case. The reason I'm showing you this case is to concentrate on this area here. Before proceeding, let's emphasize that this C shaped structure is the first strip. The reason I say this is that the first rib has a different orientation and appearance in comparison to the other ribs here. The other observation is that this accessory structure on the right side is not present on the left side. It is not the first rib since we see the C-shaped first rib on the right side. This is consistent with an accessory rib or what we call a cervical rib. As you know, ribs should arise from the thoracic spine, not from the cervical spine. Although this is an easy observation for radiology residents, many would miss it uh, during practice. Some would see it and would question if this is truly a cervical rib versus a dysplastic first rib. If you're wondering about that, the easiest way to confirm your thoughts is to look at the transverse process of the vertebral bodies. A transverse process of a cervical vertebra points downwards, while that of a thoracic vertebra points upwards. Look at the transverse process of this C7 vertebra. It almost points downwards. Compare that to the transverse process of the first thoracic vertebra, which points upwards. Since ribs articulate normally with the transverse processes of the thoracic vertebrae, they have this angulated appearance, meaning that the transverse process of the thoracic vertebral body points upwards while the rib points downwards, creating what looks like an angle. Since a cervical transverse process points downwards, an accessory cervical rib would not have that kind of angle. In the case of a cervical rib, the cervical rib will have a smooth downslope continuation with that of the transverse process. Remember that cervical ribs, whether unilateral or bilateral, are relatively common. As a wise mentor once told me, if you don't see two cervical ribs during your chest imaging rotation, you're not looking closely. To summarize, accessory cervical ribs are common, and they have a different appearance compared to the C-shaped appearance of the normal first rib. If you're in doubt, remember that a cervical rib has a smooth down sloping curvature that continues with the direction of the transverse process. That is in comparison to normal ribs that create an angle with an upward directed thoracic transverse process. Thanks for watching. More cases later.